Chapter 19 is, is one of the most interesting ones in the history, or I think in history, because some time ago, I want, you, I want you to do this while we go through this chapter. I want you to think about the city you live in. I want you to think about the different sections of the city. Uh, as I teach this class here in Ecuador, I have the students go through and ask their grandparents, what was it like in Guayaquil 75 years ago? If some of them have great grandparents, let's ask them about 100 years ago. And what were the most important things that happened in your city that contributed to its growth 100 years ago or 125 years ago? And then think about, as you go through, you, of course, we're going to talk about what caused the United States to turn from an agricultural, urb, uh, a suburban, uh, out in the country type place to an urban culture. Uh, last spring, I took a course, uh, a graduate course in American history, and it was, uh, it was all about the what was what was the, the the growth of the city we studied transportation streets street cars horse drawn vehicles with the uh, the what the horses leave in the streets and the trolley cars and subways and elevated railroads uh, all the things that people needed to get around the the cities 100 125 years ago we studied cemeteries, hotels, motels, hospitals, universities. We studied uh, department stores, malls, skyscrapers, zoos, diners, restaurants, parks, airports. In general, the development of what it took to turn small communities into large metropolitan areas, such as you find when you go to, well, Lima's one, uh, New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, what did it take to make those places what they are? I wrote a paper for that particular course about the birth and the development of the urban and then suburban malls. And the founder of the malls, his name was Victor Grun. Uh, and, I, and I enjoyed doing the research for the, for the paper. The industrial development was the motivation, was the driver in, in the development of cities. In, in those days, 100, 125, 140 years ago, 50 years ago even, the factories uh, were manned by uh, mostly immigrants. They were downtown in many areas. They were the center of employment. Transportation, people had to get to and from work which drove the invention of or the or the expansion of uh, urban urban transportation i used to live in a, in a city in massachusetts it was called holyoke h-o-l-y-o-k-e and back in the middle of the 1800s holyoke was one of the major manufacturing cities in the united states and it was built in a very rigid planned checkerboard square streets running north south and then east west right on the edge of the connecticut river flowing very quickly so they dammed the river and then ran canals through the city and then built uh, large very large factories right next to the canals that were driven by the water power from the river the workers lived around the, the factories and then as you go up the hill away from the river you find the the scale the the stratus of economic growth where uh, above the factories and above some of the the tenement buildings where the factory workers lived you find main street where city hall was and a lot of stores and then as you go further up the hill and away from the river and away from the factories, you find middle class houses. And then the higher you go, you find larger houses. Uh, I bought many years ago, I bought a, a 24 room Victorian mansion and rehabilitated it because I used to enjoy carpentry. I got old, I don't enjoy that kind of stuff anymore. And then the city begins to what they call to sprawl, to spread out into further urban development and eventually suburban areas. Some of the, uh, the main manufacturing in Holyoke, Massachusetts, at one time it was the silk capital of the Western world. Uh, 
and I still see notebooks made in uh, Holyoke uh, factories. Other cities, like New York City, was famous or most known for its shoes. Other New England cities, like Lowell and Fall River, were known for textiles. Chicago, because of its proximity to the west, where the railroads coming in from all the way up from Texas and the different trails where they used to drive the cattle all the way north to Chicago to the, what you call in Spanish, the uh, camal and the meat and, and the meat packing. And as they expanded, it just cre creates more and more demand, more, si more sophistication of transportation, better sanitation for the city's communications, commercial spaces, more and more people working, making more and more money. They, the market is there, so the people, the merchant, merchants of the city create more opportunities for people to buy things that the people are making. And then by a hundred years ago, it creates more demand for recreation spaces. If you go to New York City, it's the best, probably the best example I can think of off the top of my head because there are uh, public beaches down in, in South Brooklyn on the ocean. You can go out to Long Island, um, of course the baseball parks, and then the, of course in New York City there's Central Park, one of the most famous parks in the world. Mechanization simply means people have to get around. You can't, I, if you've ever been to New York City, you, you walk and walk and walk until you think your legs are going to fall off. Uh, electric streetcars came along in the 1880s, 1890s, and then they had something called the L. If you watch old movies about New York City, overhead railroads is what they really were. And then eventually, beginning in Boston, uh, creating subways. Now there's subways all over the world, except for us who live right next to the ocean. Mass transit creates the greatest demand of growing population. People have to get around, and as mass transit expands, then people can move further and further away from the downtown, away from the urban centers, and by the 1920s and 30s, and then for sure after the Second World War, the 1950s, you have a great expansion into the suburban, suburban areas of the United States. The cities were also very attractive for in-migration, meaning the people from the countryside moving into the cities, you, particularly for young people looking for more opportunities. I think about a, looking, a mental map of Guayaquil, Ecuador, which 50, 60 years ago was one, one 20, 25% of the population of what it is today. And now there's just it may be 400,000 people. Now it's a city of over two and a half million people. And I don't know the population of Lima. I should have looked it up, but you have a, I've only been to Lima once. It's, it's a huge, huge, huge city that keeps, it keeps on expanding. And I'm sure there are many rural areas outside that weren't there 50 years ago or 40. I live in one in Guayaquil that didn't exist 40 years ago. Why was the city so attractive? Look around, people coming in, in from the, in, in Ecuador, people come from the Sierra, and I'm sure in Lima it's the same thing. And if you go around the city, you'll find groups of people from one certain city that uh, somebody went to Lima uh, 50 years ago, and they told their relatives, come on down, let us live in Lima, because it's, there's a lot of work available here, and you'll find little groups around the city like that. Of course, it's a lot more fun. If you go up into some of the little pueblos in the, in this, in the Andes Mountains of, of Ecuador and, and Peru too, uh, those young people are not happy living up there and they come down to the big city because there's work opportunities more than anything and there's opportunities for advancement in work and diversity in work and education and the fun and games that goes along with living in big cities that you don't find in, in any rural communities. And then, like I said, the ethnic groups dreamed of living in the cities becoming more, but more and more appealing, much more exciting. Then in the United States, from the late 1800s, you have a, a, an explosion of immigration. If you ever get a chance, you can see a movie, it's called The Gangs of New York. And it's about the 1850s when the many Irish, 1850s and 1860s, when the many Irish were coming into the New York Harbor and the nativists being those uh, native-born Americans, 
and they were anti, for in, in the case of the Irish or later the Italians, anti, uh, uh, even though the Irish spoke English, an Irish English, anti-Catholic, anti-Roman Catholic, anti-immigrant, immigrants coming in are going to take our jobs. And you, and you can still find this in, in probably most places in the world, but in the United States, particularly in the United States, or Canada or Australia, in Australia they have a great movement against Asians migrating to Australia or immigrating to Australia. In Europe they have a great uh, anti-immigrant, anti-immigrants uh, from North Africa going to, to, um, going to Spain and going to France and people from the Balkan countries moving to Germany and I don't even think many of them get into Switzerland and if you go to Italy, Italy, Italia, and if you go to Spain from Ecuador or Peru, I think, I don't think, I know, you will find anti-immigrant uh, sentiments. If you go to England, you will find anti-Muslim sentiments. It's nothing new and it's not going to change as people move around in their, in their lives looking for better, better life. Simple as that. The pressures of population do create uh, different demands and needs for a government and for and for the country as a whole. The immigrants from northern and western Europe were the first. If you look at American history, well, I can't say the first; they're the second because the Indians were already there. But from the seven fifteen hundreds, when the English started moving into eastern what became the United States, the English, the the Scottish. Uh, and then later Scandinavians, Northern European being white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant descent, and then later in the 1860s and 70s and 80s and 90s and up until the 1920s, you have people from Southern and Eastern European backgrounds, Italians, the Balkans, Russians, particularly Jews, Poles, people from the Czech and, and the Austro-Hungarian Hungarian Empire, uh, these people were rejected by those who were, were already there. Fear of the other is what I call it. They're not like us. Their food is different. Their religion is different. Their music's different. Their, song, their songs are different. And we don't want to compete with them. Urban living, as you, like I, I mentioned here, as you read and listen to this description of urban living 100 years ago, Again, think about think about Lima. What was it like a hundred years ago? What existed then, and then what's what's new? You can in some places in Guayaquil, you can still see the remains of the streetcars, the railroad tracks there for the streetcars moving north and south, particularly north and south. The immigrants didn't necessarily integrate into the native-born white Anglo-Saxon Protestant communities. They were rejected. Uh, racism social isolation, cultural differences. People tend to, when you move into a big city, uh, the new immigrants were looking for people like themselves because they needed the protection and, and people, one of my favorite movies uh, that has, that you can see this, is the uh, Godfather One. And you can see when the little boy, Don, whatever is now, I forget his name, uh, Vito, when Vito is a little boy and he leaves Sicily and, he, and there's a great scene coming into New York Harbor and the Statue of Liberty and going through Ellis Island, uh, go, to, go to YouTube and type in Ellis Island. You'll find a very interesting, interesting videos. But when little Don Vito begins to grow up in downtown Manhattan, what today we call Little Italy, and the struggles that he had and, and the camaraderie and the friendship that the Italians and the Sicilians had with each other was to protect, protect themselves from the rejection of the other cultures. And if you go to, you can go to Chinatown in San Francisco and Chinatown in New York City and Chinatown in Chicago and you can go to the barrios of all the various cities that have large Hispanic uh, communities. You see the same thing everywhere. It's nothing new and it will never go away. Different immigrants groups were always excluded by the other immigrants. They're different. Racism was not just reserved for black people. Racism against everybody. Asians, Japanese, Chinese, blacks, Mexicans, everything you can possibly imagine. The non-English speaking people were the slowest to integrate because of the language alone. 
And that's still true. And a lot of people who speak English still resent that people go to the United States or to Canada or any English-speaking country and they don't speak English and they don't learn to speak the language and of course they never really get integrated and uh, the Eng native English speakers uh, resent, uh, do I have to press one for English, two for Spanish, three for uh, Portuguese, and etc. The landlords <laughs> What's new about landlords? They exploit everybody and everything they possibly can for giving you the least and trying to charge you the most. Uh, I read recently they, there's a law, it's not a new law, that's being strictly enforced about some of the lower economic level housing in Guayaquil that no more inside, um, you can't have apartments that don't have outside windows facing outside of the building. It used to be, and then back in those days, they were extremely crowded, two, three, four immigrant families all living in one or two rooms. Uh, the plumbing, you can even, can't even imagine. Raising, uh, many years ago, I remember in Holyoke, Massachusetts, I went, uh, when I was working for the, no, it was, no, in Springfield. I was working for the mayor of Springfield and got called to an a apartment building, and they were raising to these new immigrants from Dominican Republic, I remember. They were raising chickens in the cupboards in the in the kitchen because they didn't like to go and buy chicken that was in the grocery store because that wasn't fresh. And the only way to have a fresh chicken was you you cut his head off and take him apart yourself, and that was a fresh chicken. Back in the in the 1880s, 1890s, all these things are beginning to bubble up in the in the community, and people are demanding more responsibility from government. We'll get to that in, in the next chapter, talking about pro when we get to progressivism. And, oh, there were things called um, houses. There was the Hull House. There was a social movement to try to help people who needed help. And eventually, in, instead of just condemning people and saying they were lazy or, or, or bums or something or they were of the wrong religion, or they realized and it's influenced social sciences ever since, that it was the environment that people live in that causes poverty, not poverty causing the environment the other way around. It wasn't their morals or alcohol. They weren't necessarily born alcoholic, lazy people, but it was where they lived and how they were raised that caused them to be that way. Then we're in the next chapter, I think it's the next chapter, chapter 20 is about, what is chapter, wait a second, let me see, chapter 20 is about the Gilded Age politics, and that's all, and I'll do that in a minute, that's all about the corrupt government, surprise, surprise, politicians and government are corrupt. Critical problems at the time were the corrupt political bosses, crime, corruption, safe water, human and animal waste. If you go, and you go to YouTube and you type in Jacob Riss, you type in uh, The Jungle. It was a book written about how animals were, um, the, what do you call it, the butcher, butchered animals were butchered and how they were packed and it would make you turn into a vegetarian. It probably would. If you read something like called like Fast Food Nation, you will never go to a McDonald's again. The political, bo how the political bosses bought votes with personalized, they still do. Politics everywhere, I think, maybe it's certainly not, like in the United States, they, politics is corrupt, but it's, it's not as blatant. I've been living in Ecuador for 25 years. It's blatantly corrupt. It's just, it's just amazing. They, they buy the votes. The, all of a sudden the government ha comes up for re-election and everybody gets everything but right after the re-election all the promises are forgotten and the government goes on and does what it wants. Oh surprise surprise the police are corrupt too. Well maybe when we meet at the end of this course you can tell me about some of your experiences with corrupt policemen. And in family life people have to stick together. There's no other way. Um, it wasn't until the 1950s and 60s in the United States when people uh, when you turn 18, which I did in 1964 or 60, 1963, that when you graduate from high school and you went out and got a job, or in my case you went to college and then you went in the military, that you were not going to go home. 
that was just understood. You're on your own. You can get a job. You can support yourself. Uh, grow up. I, th I have read recently that that's n not as common anymore because living is more expensive. To get a job is difficult. Those kind of things. And living here in Ecuador, I don't know many. It, I, I don't think parents even approve that they're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 year old, and even older uh, children or young adults uh, live by themselves uh, or live with their get together and two or three people share an apartment and that kind of that is not acceptable in this particular culture city management political bosses per crime I just did that oh the last thing I think almost leisure well what happened was this as long as people were working 60, 70 hours a week, they work in 10, 12 hours, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and maybe a half day on Saturday or even a full day on Saturday, and even back in the 1820s and 30s, uh, you get a half day off on Sunday just so you can go to church. They didn't think much of uh, what do I do to uh, relax because you didn't relax. You worked all the time just to barely survive. By the end of the century, in the beginning of the 20th century, they were cutting the work hour. We have now a 40-hour work week, so you work Monday through Friday, and God forbid that you should ever be asked to work. If you work on Saturday, or you get overtime, and if you work on Sunday, you get double time. But generally speaking, people want, uh, who invented TGIF? The Americans did. To increase in leisure time and less work hours, then people had time to go to the beaches and go to the mountains to go hiking and walking and camping and picnics and all the things that families enjoy. I live about 50 minutes from my apartment, uh, which is right on a cliff over the Pacific from Guayaquil. Uh, I enjoy Friday afternoon since I'm the boss at my, my college program. I can't wait to get in the car and hit the road because I want to go to the beach and, and sit back and read a book and maybe in the evening watch a movie and walk the dog. and those, That was unheard of a hundred years ago. People just didn't have it. But when it started happening, in the United States, I'm sure you know this, baseball is our favorite sport. I am particularly a baseball fanatic, a Boston Red Sox fan. In fact, right now I'm eyeing another computer in my office at home that the baseball game's on. I'm just watching. I keep the sound turned off so I can make our videos here. Um, football, uh, American football, not soccer, uh, is our another popular sport. We, we love basketball. Um, it mentions croquet, which I thought was kind of funny because uh, I, you might not even know what croquet is. It's, it's not even, it's like miniature golf, golfito or something like that with a big ball around the size of softball. And that was kind of an upper class sport. I'm sure that poor Italians in Little Italy in New York City never played croquet. Um, these kind of things were a mental diversion. Also, you begin to have a more literate uh, population, and as the population grows and, the and it becomes more literate, you have a market for newspapers, books, magazines, movies. Vaudeville was live uh, theater shows, comedies. There's a great scene in The Godfather 1 uh, about vaudeville being put on for the benefit of the poor Italian immigrants who were homesick. And then marketing, marketing itself, advertising, advertising, advertising. By the 1910s, 1920s, by the 1930s, you have real, uh, uh, excuse me, radio, you have magazines, you have uh, Sears and Roebuck, who I mentioned before, it was Sears and Moore, Roebuck and Wards, Montgomery Ward catalogs, and more and more marketing, creating more and more demand, creating more and more. Uh, when we get to the causes of the Great Depression, more and more and more eventually when markets get saturated, there's no demand and you have what happened in 1929, a stock market crash. You also have demand for parks, amusement parks. Um, maybe some of you have been to Orlando, Florida, which is a major, 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 major business, billion, billion dollar industry in the United States, worldwide. There's a Disney World or Disney something outside of Paris, uh, which some of the 
Frenchmen don't like probably, and I, I bet I don't know. I'm just guessing. There's one in Japan too, and the Chinese will definitely come up with a Chinese Disney World. <laughs> just the thoughts that are going through my mind. <laughs>